thank you very much, Helen. And um, so we'll start with the customary congratulations to everyone who's making the Earth morning session after a wonderful night before. Um, well done, everyone, and uh, you should be proud of yourselves. Um, but I'm sure, as Helen said, we've a, we've a, we've a, we've a great day in store. And before I go any further, I just want to, on my own behalf, congratulate uh, the organising committee in, in putting this all together and doing such a great job. It's um, it's been fantastic, uh, and last night was lovely. And the, those of you who joined us on the cruise and so on was was great as well. And I say, I'm sure we're in for a second day. It's my great pleasure to introduce the keynote for today. Um, uh, Susan Gibbons, University Librarian and Deputy Provost for Libraries and Scholarly Communication at Yale University. And it's very interesting when you read uh, S uh, Susan's profile, which is in your conference pack, that um, the addition of the Deputy Provost and Scholarly Communication piece is a relatively recent addition to your portfolio. And I'm sure um, you know that chimes with a lot of the themes we were discussing yesterday. And I know a lot of the areas that we ourselves are interested here with the whole uh, debate around open access and the, the, the shifts that are happening in, uh, in scholarly commotion. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Susan and hand over to her, and uh, she will allow time for questions at the end. So, Susan Gibbons. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for inviting me and, and for the wonderful hospitality. We had a great time last night on the boat ride. Uh, up and down. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some research that has been going on now for over a decade. It started at the University of Rochester. I'm now at Yale, but I want to make sure that we ground this project, its origins at the University of Rochester and make sure that that school gets, gets full credit for it. Rochester is in um, upstate New York, uh, just over the Canadian border um, from Toronto. So what I'm going to talk about today is how to study the users of our library, use that information then to make changes to the library. Um, and I, what I hope to do is explain the methodology for that study, as well as some of the findings and ways that, um, in the institutions I've been at, how we have respond to, responded to those findings. So, first of all, just to ground us, as we know, technology is rapidly changing the research practices of our students and our scholars. We also know that we are seeing this shift from ownership to access, and we as libraries need to respond to it. And then we have this amazing uh, competition going on right now with commercial vendors, where it used to be the library was the only place you can go for this information. Now we are competing with lots of other sources. Um, and we are all experiencing, regardless of what country we are in, some very severe economic constraints that are causing us to have to prioritize and sort of shift where we're gonna put our focus. So with all of this, the question is, how can we stay aligned with the users of our library? Their research practices are changing, and therefore, how can the library um, keep up with them? So what we did at Rochester was we literally brought an anthropologist onto our team at Rochester to help us study our users. This was a practice that had been done by Xerox Park, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, and they created these teams that would go into workplaces and they do observations over time, and then come back and say, well, what could Xerox create? Or what services could Xerox provide that would make that work environment a more efficient one? So we decided to adopt that methodology. We brought an anthropologist, Dr. Nancy uh, Fried Foster, onto the library staff. We created research teams, and we would go out and we would do observations of our students and our faculty. Some of the observations would be a couple months. In some cases, the projects would go on for two years or more. So we, what we did over and over again was to borrow methods of anthropology and ethnography in order to conduct the studies of our users. We had to make some modifications, but for the most part, almost every method we use can be grounded back in the study of either anthropology or ethnography. Um, and our goals were to make sure we knew the difference and this was the most, one of the most important ones, between the real needs of our users and our perceived understanding of them. Over and over again, we would say in meetings, well, when I was in college, this is how I did my work. Um, and we kept re realizing that our own experiences are so far uh, different from, from our students, that so much has changed between our own experiences and today's students, even if we've only been out of school for five years, that we had to really erase our own experiences and try to ground it back in the real ones that we were observing. We use these findings to improve services, the library's digital presence, and our physical facilities. And I'll give you a sense of each of those. 
Um, and then over and over again, trying to adapt to the changing needs of our users, even when those changes were difficult. Um, so if, for example, if the change suggests that our reference desk needed to stay open longer because our students were doing their key um, research work at 12 o'clock at night or one o'clock in the morning, those were the kind of changes that we had to uh, address as a library. So let me give you some examples. But first, here's the research cycle that we went through. So we'd start with a question. A question could be, what were the barriers to dissertation completion for our students? We would then work out several methods by which we would study this question. And it wouldn't just be a single method, we would want multiple methods, because at the end, what we need to do is triangulate what we were learning and make sure that these different methods were, were confirming the same findings. We'd gather the data, and then interdisciplinary teams would be studying the data out of which came our findings. And then this brown circle here, change, that's the hardest part of this entire process. Because you can discover what you need to do, you have to be ready to make that change. If you don't make the changes, if you don't respond to your findings, then your user population is going to stop participating. They need to see that this really made a difference, because often they're devoting a good bit of time to work with you. And if you can't show some, some changes back to how you've improved the library as a result, why should they continue to, to participate in the process? So it's very, very important to have sort of institutional, at least within the library, institutional support of what you're doing so that you can make it through the entire cycle, then you start again. So let's go through some examples. Um, at Rochester, we, this, this methodology started in 2003 and it continued on to about 2012, so nine years. Among the m many questions studied were how do students write and their research papers and do their research? What were the barriers to thesis or dissertation completion? And how are the physical science libraries being used? We observed that there were a lot of students in our physical science libraries but they weren't actually using the physical collections. So how do we understand what's going on there? So that we could defend or say we, that we needed that space in the library or to say, well, in the science library, we don't need that space anymore. So you, we needed grounding um, and evidence to make those uh, determinations. From Yale, uh, we've also done some of these studies, although not to the same extent. There we looked at barriers to dissertation completion, specifically for humanities students. We wanted to understand how to design a center for teaching and learning in the library. And right now we're doing a study of how to design a digital humanities lab. So I'm gonna give two examples. The first would be for undergraduates and that term, does that term mean something here? Undergraduates, the first four years working towards a bachelor's degree. And then graduate students, either working for a master's degree or a PhD. And our question was for the undergraduate students, push this, we wanted to know how to improve library support of undergraduates. And so the first question we had is, well, what makes an A paper, the highest grade that you can get on your paper? And then what happens between the point at which a professor assigns a research paper and the paper is handed in? We called that the black box. Activities occurred in that, in that gap, but we didn't understand what they were. And we wanted to explore what that black box contained. What were students doing? as they were working on their research papers. So we had students who volunteered to participate with us. Their faculty members, their professors, identified students who were working on a major research paper, and those students agreed to participate. Throughout the semester, we would shadow the students. And by shadowing, I don't mean we followed them to class. What we did was we would be in regular touch with them. About once a week, we would ask how they were doing on their research paper. Had they come up with their thesis? Did they think they had enough time to finish? What were the challenges? All of that. Then when the student was finished, the day that, ideally, the day the student handed in the research paper, we invited him or her in for an interview. And we wanted to relive that entire process. So during the interview, uh, the students would start drawing. And there's no grade for artistic ability. Uh, but they would draw out the process by which they did their research papers. So at the top, we have the professor and the student talking. And at the bottom, it's hard to see there. But essentially, what it says is they printed out four copies, three of them for professors who were reviewing the thesis, and one for a competition he was, a, he was um, submitting his paper to. So over and over again, we get very, very rich transcripts and then these uh, visual aids to go along with those transcripts. So as we were doing this, we started to see some patterns. 
And the first pattern that we saw was mom and dad would show up in these diagrams. And so this is 2005, I think, when we, we first started doing this. So this is essentially the helicopter parent. Is that, is that a term that makes sense? So the hovering parents. So, because we never asked in the interview, what role did your mother or father play in writing this paper? It just came through naturally in their discussion. And it wasn't just this one student, here's another, who uh, emailed the paper to his father and then the same day, the father responded with advice on the paper and, and it goes on from there. So over and over again, we saw parents in these research processes. So we had these enormous debates about what to do about it. We, we just felt it's wrong for the parents to be involved, but that, who are we to make that decision? They have, you have a wonderful relationship with their parent, heaven forbid the library interfere with that, we weren't going there. But we felt we had to do something with this information. And so we had an opportunity, let's see, we used to do a freshman orientation, and you might do this yourself, where the first day that your students are on campus, they are invited to a large auditorium, and a rotation of speakers comes through, and it might be the athletic facility or the health clinic, and the library gets 20 minutes. And we would go up and we'd talk about the great things about the library for 20 minutes, and the students paid absolutely no attention, and rightfully so. This was their first day on campus. They were just coming to university. Their interests were, am I gonna get along with my roommate? What are the right classes? Is this the right university for me? Should I have broken up with my boyfriend or girlfriend before coming? That's what they're thinking about, and rightly so. They did not care about the library. So we said, enough of this. We're not gonna to try to deliver this message. So what we did was we canceled our participation in the freshman orientation. Instead, we decided to do a parent orientation because the university was struggling with the fact that the parents would come, drop off their students, but then weren't leaving. They were sort of hovering about on campus, and no one knew what to do with these parents. They were just everywhere. So we raised our hands and said, the library will take the parents. And so we ended up doing a parent orientation session. So in the morning, the library would open up. All staff were on hand, hands on deck. It was necessary for us all to be there. We had a lovely breakfast. We would talk to the parents individually. There would be some crying going on because there's this, this emotional det attachment with your children. We were the counselors, but it was wonderful for the parents because they were talking to an adult. They were talking to someone who could actually have an impact on their students while they're at college, and we could then deliver a very important message. And the message was, at some point, your son or daughter is gonna call, email, text, something, saying that they're working on a research paper. They're gonna seek your help. What we would love for you to do is say instead, have you talked to your librarian? Because every class at the University of Rochester had a librarian assigned to it. So we'd hand out our cards, we'd hand out our information and say, please, when they come talking to you, make the handoff to us and we promise to be there and to help them out. And this continues on to this day, it's, it's almost a decade later, we continue to, University of Rochester continues to do the orientation for the parents, delivering this message. It helped out the university tremendously and it helped get our message across very nicely. What we also saw was that, um, and this was an obvious thing, but we needed that reminder. We often think of a, a research project as you do the research and then you write. It's a linear process from one to the other. And obviously that is not the case. Rather, what we were seeing over and over again is students were struggling to articulate what their problem was in the research process. They thought maybe they had a writing problem, but when we saw it, we saw, in fact, no, you haven't done the research correctly. You don't have all the information you need, or vice versa. So the students couldn't always um, articulate what their problem was in the writing process. So what we started to do was cross-train with the writing center on campus so that our librarians had some knowledge of how to give assistance when a student came with a problem with a writing problem. Meanwhile, we worked with the writing center to help them identify when a problem is a research problem. Because we, what we really wanted is if a student comes up to, a, to someone on campus and says, I need help, the worst thing that could happen at that point is you say, well, I'm sorry, you've come to the wrong desk you really need to go to the writing center, which is across campus, or vice versa. So we did a lot of cross-training to make sure that the staff could help, whether in the writing center or in the library. The other thing that we saw through this project was that the students were unfamiliar with the expertise of our librarians. They saw us as helpful people, which was wonderful, 
but they didn't recognize that we in fact had advanced degrees in the subjects that we were the librarians for. Um, so at Rochester, we, we were trying to uh, attach ourselves to the Pokemon trading card um, trend of the day. And so we created the librarian trading cards. And it seems a little silly, but it worked. And it became a competition. Can you collect all the trading cards of all the librarians? Get them signed. We, silly games that go with it, but it actually helped to convey to um, the students that in fact we had expertise. On the back of the card was our degrees and how you can contact us. Now as you can imagine, this would not, well you can't, you wouldn't know. At Yale, this would never work, <laughs> let me just say. Never going to work at Yale. Uh, Rochester is a very geeky place, and this fit very nicely with the culture of the students. At Yale, it is geeky, but in a different way. Um, so what we did at Yale, and it's, it started before I got there, was we have what's called a personal librarian program. Every incoming freshman is assigned a librarian. It's about 1 to 35, so one librarian to 35 students. Um, we do receptions where you can come and meet your personal librarian. Throughout the semester, it's the job of the librarian to contact the student to ask if they're working on a research paper. What's the topic? Did you know we have these resources? Would you like to get that together for a cup of coffee and talk about it? So you have this relationship with your personal librarian in your freshman year. And then when you declare your major in your third year, you are then introduced to the librarian who's the expert in that discipline. So that by the time you end, you have two librarians who are working with you throughout the, your time at Yale. So let's go on to graduate students. And both at Rochester and at Yale, we were focused on what are the barriers to completion of those dissertations. What we're seeing in the United States, and I think we're seeing elsewhere, is the time to dissertation completion is getting longer and longer, seven, eight, nine, ten years to finish. Um, and we wanted to know why. At Rochester, we looked at all the disciplines. At Yale, we just focused on the humanities because we had seen a report by the graduate school that really focused on the problems within the humanities, and we wanted to understand that more. So what we would do is what we call in-situ interviews. We would ask to do an interview of the student, but we wanted to do it in the place that they did most of their work. So it, sometimes it would be their apartments, sometimes it would be their laboratories, but we would have a videotape of the interview as well as an audio tape, and then we would ask questions. When do you print out an article that you would file in that, in that box that the student is working with? When do you check out a book versus buying a book? Introduce us to your computer. What software do you have on your computer? How do you write your papers? What tools are you using? So we'd have a very, very rich understanding of their work environments as a result of these many interviews. What we found, and these are the uh, findings that are similar both to Rochester and Yale, one is that there's a problem of a magical summer for graduate students. What I mean by that is when we interviewed faculty, when we interviewed professors and said, what are the expectations you have for a fourth year student, undergraduate student, doing research? And they would articulate what they expect. Much later in an interview with the professors, we'd say, what are your expectations for what a first year graduate student can do in terms of research? And they would talk about their expectations. These two things were incredibly different. Yet, for many students, the difference is three months of summer. They graduate, they get their bachelor's degree, three, four months later they start their graduate school. What happened in that summer that would cause them to have different research skills, a much higher skill as a graduate student than as an undergraduate? The reality is there's no difference whatsoever, and certainly the students didn't recognize any difference, yet the faculty, the professors, had this expectation that an incoming graduate student had much higher research skills than a graduating undergraduate student. Um, so we are, we're very focused on this idea of this magical summer. And what, so when we would talk to graduate students, one, we would warn them of this problem, that your, your professors have a higher expectation of you right now than they did four months ago. But you have the, your librarians here, and we're going to help you get through this and get to the level that your professors expect of you. So while we don't do um, uh, orientations for undergraduate students, we do do very discipline-specific orientations for graduate students because they need to be working with us from day one. Another finding was just twice the timing, the importance of the timing of introduction of research tools. And what I mean by that is we would do these exercises where we'd ask students, you have a magic wand and you can create a tool, what is that tool doing for you? 
And what we heard over and over again was, it would help me with citations and references and my bibliography. And we thought, well, terrific, because it already exists. It's EndNote, it's RefWorks, it's something like that. So we um, uh, signed up for those as an institutional license, and then we would do the exercise again. We'd ask the students, what was this magical tool going to be for you? It would help me with my bibliography, my references, my citations. We're like, well, OK, that didn't work. Let's advertise. So we had this huge advertisement campaign for EndNote and RefWorks. Did the exercise several months later, and the same result. I wish this tool would help me with my references and my citations. And finally, what we came to understand when we really dug into it was that the timing of this was completely wrong. We were trying to introduce these tools to our students as they were starting the dissertation process, because it seemed to us that's the time you need to use these tools. What we came to understand is that students, when they start the dissertation process, the toolkit is locked down for them. They don't want anything new coming into that process. They want to be very, very comfortable and fluent with the tools that they are using. So what we came to understand was the timing required us to introduce these tools as they first arrived on campus so that they could use them for their smaller papers that they're doing in their first couple years. So that once they started the dissertation, it was a comfortable tool that they felt very um, confident was going to be successful and not this new fandangle thing going on at the time of dissertation because what if something goes wrong? That would be catastrophic for them. So we became much more attuned to issues about timing and when we were introducing services and tools to our users. We also saw the power of the human network, and this is a, a question that we continue to, to wonder about, is how can the librarians be part of their networks? So when we asked students, how did you learn about this article? What conferences do you go to and who gives you the advice? Um, where do you seek help? It often is a network of individuals, either fellow graduate students, students at other institutions that they had met along the way, uh, postdoc students, faculty members, there's a network there. And that was the most important gr group to um, influence the behaviors of those students. So we have looked at over and over again, well, how can the librarian be seen as a full-fledged member of that network? Is it making sure that their um, expertise is, is better understood or something like that? But it's, it's an interesting question that I think all of us need to continue to think about so that when they have a question, the librarian is just as, it's just as possible for the student to go to a librarian and ask as they would um, a fellow graduate student or a faculty member. At Rochester, we found some different findings. And, and I want to pause here and, and make the point that the findings are unique to the institution. So while I'd encourage you to borrow some of the methodologies that we talk about today, don't borrow the findings because it's really about your local institution. Just as using anthropology to study a particular tribe, you can't take that finding and apply it to another one. And really, we are looking at different tribes. So it depends on whether your university is humanities-based or IT, whether the students are commuting or they live on campus, whether even the weather itself, if it's lovely out, then they spend more time outside versus inside. All of these things combine to make it quite unique. So please don't, don't borrow all the findings, but instead think about the methodologies. So a finding at Rochester was a real problem of space. Our graduate students felt that they had no place on campus that was theirs, and so would do most of their research, particularly humanities students, in their apartments off-site, off-campus, because we didn't have graduate student apartments. And they felt incredibly isolated and had no uh, feedback to tell them that the, the suffering of, of being a graduate student and writing your dissertation was in fact natural to the process. There was nothing to signal to them that what they were doing was correct and it was right. So we invited graduate students to draw for us what their ideal spaces would look like. What was interesting is the number one issue was there's no graduate students in their graduate space. And at first, we said, you know, we're not comfortable with that. We should be a community of scholars of all ages, on and on. But the graduate students had a very uh, good reasoning for this. Graduate students, in addition to doing their own research and writing their dissertation, they're also often teaching assistants. They're helping undergraduates in the classroom. 
And what they were finding is when they were studying in the library, the students from their classes would see them and say, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I'm struggling with this physics problem. Can you please help me? They needed a place to go where they could take off the hat of being a teaching assistant and could just wear the hat of being a student working on a dissertation. So when we understood that, we, we actually at Rochester decided we would create spaces that were just for graduate students. They wanted it to be a place where they could be solitary but also work with others, um, needed a variety of seating. I'm reading a book, I want a comfy chair versus I'm writing, I need a table and I need some privacy. Lots of outlets, of course, for their laptops and very good lighting. So we took that information, we did design charrettes where we invited the students to draw, and this is one of dozens of drawings. We would then take the drawings and we'd go work with architects, where we didn't have a program to give architects. Instead, we had these drawings and said, help us make sure that the spaces we create reflect what the students are looking for. Um, and then, based on that, we were able to create two graduate student spaces. What was um, wonderful about this project is we had such rich data we had such um, information about how much we thought this would impact, in a positive way, graduate students, if the library could create these spaces, that we were able to find a donor who gave us money for the first room. And then he was so pleased with the project that he gave us money to do, then do a second room. So the entire project was funded by an alumnus uh, of the university. But it was only because we could tell great stories about how we thought this would make a difference. At Yale, what was really interesting is we found special collections to be a real challenge for our students. First of all, um, their dissertations often dealt with primary source material. Um, and they didn't have a lot of experience working in archives, doing archival research. And so we've done um, more classes where we can work with graduate students to introduce them to archival research before they go abroad and go visit an archive. Second, we see, and I'm sure you do as well, the paleography challenges that they can't read handwriting. Um, and we really need to spend some time teaching them how to read the handwriting of whatever century that they're working in. So we now do paleography courses in the library. But the most important thing we saw over and over again was uh, their struggles to do special collection research outside of Yale. So they would save up all their money and in the summer, they'd go to Italy, and they would spend you know, two weeks, in their mind, two weeks to do archival research in Italy in August. Okay? And of course, as you know, <laughs> it's all shut down. It's, it doesn't happen that way. They had no idea, because they presumed that it worked the same way at Yale as it would work in the rest of the world. So they would show up without a letter of introduction. They would show up in August when, of course, the, the archives were closed. They presumed they could take digital photography of what they were working with, but of course wasn't the case. The, the list went on and on and on. So when we interviewed them, we heard just these horror stories of how their dissertation was delayed by a year or so because they had saved up all their money, made this assumption of what that experience was going to be like, and were completely wrong about it. So now what we do is we're working with students to say, if you're going abroad, please meet with us. Let us give you letters of introduction. Let us prepare you for what you're going to see when you go abroad, because Yale is incredibly liberal with our special collections. Anyone can use our special collections. All you need is a passport or a driver's license. We, no letter of introduction, nothing else. And so the students assume that's what the rest of the world is like. And we know that's not the case. So we spend a lot of time now trying to prepare them and really when it went wrong, it literally added a year or so to their dissertation. So when asking the question, what is the barrier to dissertation completion, this ended up being a key piece of it, that the library has taken on the role of trying to help students. So with all of this work brought together, what did we, what do you come away with understanding? Um, and one of them, a key one, is that the barriers to entry need to be lowered. And what we mean by that is, when we started this project at Rochester back in 2003, if we had looked at our, go back and look at that website, we loved our acronyms. We loved our esoteric language that meant library. So we would say, ILL, click here. So, you know, ILL, interlibrary loan. We know what it means, nobody else does. So we would have this language on our website. We would have language to explain we are bibliographers. Again, that means nothing to our students. So we had to be really, really conscious of, of our, the language and vocabulary that we we're using. 
we had to think about what are the barriers to actually using our collections. And a great example at Yale is that we see over and over again, students find out that something's available, but it's available in microfilm. And they're like, yeah, never mind. I'm not interested in doing that research anymore. And they go in a different direction. We have the second largest microfilm collection in the country, and no one's using it. So what do we do? We now offer services where we'll digitize that microfilm for you and s uh, send it to you electronically. So what are the barriers that are getting in the way? What might we do to make it a little bit easier? We're not trying to dumb it down, but we want you to use our collections because that's what our purpose is on, on campus. So another one would be, um, we saw a lot of blending of academic and social. In other words, if we, we would do observations where we'd walk around the library, see what people are doing, we might see Facebook, or probably not anymore, but at the time, Facebook would be on, on their computers, and we thought, gosh, they're just hanging out in the library, Facebooking and, uh, all day long, and assumed it was a social experience. As we did the studies and we came to talk about Facebook, what we understood is within Facebook would be these human networks of scholars, that these students were actually communicating with other students in American studies or medieval history or whatever from around the world and they were doing it through Facebook. So we had to be really careful not to make judgments um, about what is social and what is academic, that the two things are interweaving. And now YouTube, as I'm sure you're all observing, YouTube has become an instruction uh, platform, that if they don't quite understand a topic, they can find an, a video on YouTube that will explain it to them. So you can no longer look at YouTube and say that's social versus um, uh, academic work. We saw the importance of physical spaces. The library has a very special place on campus, and this is confirmed over and over again. It is symb a symbolic place. It is a place where all the disciplines are welcome. It is a neutral space. Whether you're an undergraduate, you're a faculty, you're in science, you're in history, you're in philosophy, the library welcomes everyone. So no one comes to the door and says, I wonder if I belong in this, in this building on campus. Where, if they are an uh, English student, they might wonder if they should go into a science building. If they're not an athlete, should they go into the athletic facility? If they're not a musician, should they be in the music hall? No one asks those questions about libraries. So it has a very important um, space on campus that it's important for us to preserve. And what we see happening in the US, and I suspect is happening elsewhere, is that other services on campus that are neutral, that are meant for everybody, are often being placed within the library's building. A writing center would be one, a center for teaching and learning, something like that, because they want that power of neutrality to carry over into, um, into the, the new services that they're placing in the library. So the other thing we saw over and over again was students articulating what we would call a scholarly gravitas to the library. They came to the library when they wanted to get serious with their study. They didn't necessarily need our physical collections. They just wanted to be in that space so that they could, because in their own mindset, they're saying, now I'm going to get serious with my studying. So it's important, I think, I would argue, to keep sort of the awe-inspiring parts of our spaces. We definitely need the Starbucks-like cafe conversation areas, but we still also need that quiet, contemplative spaces, and students are looking for both of those. As long as they're not overlapping and you have you know, talking going on in a quiet space, the library can support both. And, and probably should if you have the space to do so. We saw over and over again that the technology and the literature are intertwined. It is not possible to be um, a librarian in, working in public health, for example, if you do not know GIS, Geoinformation System. If you don't know how that technology works, you're not going to be able to be um, an assistant to a student all the way through because they're going to get to a data question. And if you can't go deep with that data, if you don't know how that tool works, um, you're going to struggle. We're seeing it with, um, in the humanities, that we need to be able to do uh, textual analysis. And our librarians need to know how to do Python and R and all of these other tools that help take literature in print, digitize it, turn it into a data set of text, and then do data analysis. Every discipline, we're starting to see that the tools of the discipline, the technology of the discipline, is necessary now in order to really serve up and help students in that discipline. Um, I also would argue we are increasingly defined by our services, not by our collections. 
What I mean there is yes, we all have unique special collections, but the rest of our collections, we all have a JSTOR, we all have EBSCO, we all sort of had the same Elsevier package on and on. We are very, very similar except for our special collections. What distinguishes us are the services that we're able to provide to our community, whether it's data management, whether it's GIS, whether it's text mining, those are the things now that the university is looking at and saying that's what makes the library unique and important to us. It isn't how many volumes we have on the shelf um, because if they're not being used, then what does it matter? We need to embrace experimentation. Some of the things that we just, some of our findings in these studies we decided how we were going to respond to them, and they were just wrong. We would design spaces that were a disaster. So you need to be comfortable with experimentation, and you need to have an assessment built into whatever you are doing. So don't just try something out and, say, and, and walk away. You try something out, and you have an assessment plan for how you're going to see if it's actually accomplishing what you set out to do. So it requires a real R&D mentality, research and development mentality. It requires a tolerance for change and a tolerance for failure, which in my experience isn't something we're comfortable with within the library world. We expect perfection from the beginning. Lastly, what I wanted to do is talk about alignment, and what we've talked about is alignment with students and with faculty to some extent. I think it's also important to think about alignment with our host institutions. And this really comes from that deputy provost title that I have, and being in the provost office enough, it's caused me to think a lot about, well, what exactly does Yale benefit by having a library and how can I assist? So it's, if you read a lot of uh, MBA or, or management training, it's always talking about managing up. So what does it mean to manage up if you're, if you're running a library? One way to look at it is what are the things that are keeping your provost, vice chancellor, chancellor, whatever that title is, what are they concerned about and is there a way that the library can contribute to a solution there? So. As an example we talked about earlier is the helicopter parents. This was a huge crisis for, for the University of Rochester, these parents just wandering all about campus. We found a way to help with this problem and it has since turned into a, a much larger parent orientation program. But it was a problem that they were having that the library solved. We are seeing within the United States, there's a requirement if you're going to get a federal grant, National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health, on and on, you must have a data management plan. And I think it's starting to spread all over. Our faculty and our graduate students, they don't know how to create a data management plan. They know the data that they're going to work with. But they, ha they really struggle with the articulation of how they're going to arrange that data, describe it, preserve it, and make it discoverable by others. That's what we do in the library all day long, is we describe things, we you know, put them in places, we make them discoverable by others, and we preserve them. So on our campus at Yale, we have now got, moved ourselves into the services of data management so that we can partner with our grant writers, our faculty who are writing the grants, so that they have more successful grant applications because they have a stronger data management plan in that application. And that's a crisis right now in the US, is there's less money for these grant research grants. And so anything you can do to help your institution be more successful with their grant applications is very much appreciated and you sort of, you, there's a, a huge uh, win back to the library to be seen as a partner in that problem. For some campuses, safety is an issue. Where can students go to be safe on campus, particularly after hours? At Rochester, this was one of the issues. And so we ended up creating a 24-hour space within the library. It was not staffed by library staff, but it was a safe space. Swipe, swipe your ID card. You can come into the space. There were security guards who would walk through. It was a wonderful place for students to be. They were guaranteed a level of safety there, but it didn't require the library to put on a, a third shift of staff or anything else. But we dedicated some space that we had to solve a particular problem on campus that was a, was a concern about safety. As we talked about, or I talked about, um, the humanities PhD co um, completion. That's been a real problem at, uh, at Yale. And through our study, we spent two years studying our humanities uh, PhD students, we were able to make changes in the library, as I talked about, but we were also able to take our information and share it with the graduate school, 
share it with the various departments within the humanities to help them think about what do faculty need to do differently? What does the graduate school need to do differently? How does Yale just need to do things differently for students to be more successful? So they weren't expecting the library to provide them with this wonderful report, but that report is very much appreciated and being used to make changes across the entire campus. Um, another area would be the, what we call in the US the yield. So those students who, who are admitted to your school and decide to attend your school, that's the yield. And so how do you improve the yield of your uh, institution? Part of it is through distinguishing the educational experience. So why would a student want to come to Yale versus Harvard versus Columbia, someplace else? What is it that's different? Libraries can help to distinguish that experience, particularly if you have strong special collections, and you can talk about how you can teach with those collections, how a first-year undergraduate student is going to be handling the diaries of Brigham Young or um, the diaries of uh, Lewis and Clark and their expedition, as opposed to just reading a textbook about the Lewis and Clark expedition of the Western Americana. That is what distinguishes it, and we want to make sure as students are considering that, we are highlighting the difference that the library is going to make. Student retention is another area. So once the students agree to come and they're there, how many of them stick through those four years of undergraduate experience? We think that the personal librarian program is helping with that because we're actually having these interactions early on and providing the students with the scaffolding of helpful people from the very start. And so we're part of that program as well. And then, of course, faculty recruitment and retention. So when Yale is trying to recruit a superstar to the university, the library is called to bring out our collections, to talk about what's unique here, to really make sure they get excited about what teaching is going to be like at Yale because we can go beyond um, the, the traditional uh, books and journals and we have just such rich special collections. So we want to get them excited and we're actually part of that process to make sure we get the faculty to campus and then to help retain them on campus. So these are not necessarily library problems. These are institutional problems, but these are all areas that the library can be contributing to make the institution more successful. So I'm going to wrap up just by pointing out there is a, um, the work we did at Rochester has now spread across the world. Um, and Anthrolib is a listserv that uh, anthropologists or librarians who are doing this kind of study share ideas on. Um, and Nancy Foster, who is the anthropologist we worked with, she runs the Anthrolib. And these little push pins are all the different places where these kinds of studies are going on. It's a gross underrepresentation um, of the work that's happening. And then lastly, if I can push this, there we go. Um, there's a lot of information that's out there. Four books have come out of the University of Rochester. The first two um, were about studying students, studying those undergraduate students. Um, and then I have a URL, which hopefully you can see, that leads to the repository at Rochester where a lot of the articles have been put. Um, but it isn't just Rochester who's doing this work. So you can, through the Anthrolib, there's also a bibliography there. You can see the kinds of um, work that's going on, and it will give you a sense of, I'm interested in studying this particular problem. How have others done it? What are the methodologies that could be used? What are the questions that could be asked? And then find a network of individuals to work together. You don't always need an anthropologist on staff to do this work. It helps to have someone with that background, but many universities have an anthropology department there. So I've seen many institutions that have tapped the anthropology department and partnered with the library to do this kind of work. <laughs>